How's everybody doing? Dr. Jillard again. It is Wednesday. It is week eight. It is the spring of 2020. Sorry, did not have time to convert these to PowerPoint I'm running behind this week. And yep, here we go. So we're starting, obviously starting the lung examination now. We just finished the heart. And these are the lungs. Hopefully you know what the lungs are they're underneath the rib cage uh, they cover the heart so this is kind of a cartoon here so that's where we're going if you look for a P to A view some important fun facts here so T10 Bates is the oldest board book it's using T10 as the bottom of the lung or the base of the lungs uh, so that's important to know trapezius muscles also come down about this region as well the kind of kind of that little V kind of ends there. Here is a A to P view again. The important part of this is remember we talked a lot about the heart and the pericardial cavity, the fibrous pericardium, but how there's a sac in between or how there's a cavity in between pleural cavity, how it can fill up with fluid. Same type of deal here. Uh, we have a deflated lungs here so we can see uh, the pleura so this is the parietal pleura layer and you can't see they didn't draw in but that shiny stuff is visceral pleura and this whole space right here is the pleural cavity of course this would be very thin when the lungs were blown up uh, but the, just like the pericardium the pleura the cells of the pleura lining here they secrete fluid as well so you get pleural fluid you can get a little bit of pleural fluid is normal to to help decrease friction as your lungs are expanding and then uh, contracting or kind of pulling back in um, so that's important concept we'll talk a bit about that that's the pleural cavity right you can break lungs down of course into segments and not so interested in that but you should know what's the difference between the right and the left lung right lung has three lobes the left lung has two lobes right there's an upper both have uppers both have lower lobes right lung has a middle lobe so that's kind of the difference between that and then we have the tracheobronchial tree We'll talk about this more when we get in class, but that's important with regard to asthma, things like that. But uh, you have the trachea at the carina, it splits into a right and left main stem bronchi, or right and left main stem bronchi. Bronchus is singular. Those split into lobular pieces, so there's three lobular bronchi on the right side. One, two, three and there is two lobular bronchi on the left side because there's only two lobes and those split into segmental bronchi the, notice the tubes are getting smaller and smaller what holds this tube open? well it's cartilage up here and because when you take a deep breath in you put a tremendous negative collapsing pressure inside this tube and it won't collapse because of these cartilage rings but you lose cartilage as you go smaller and smaller and smaller when you get to some of these small bronchioles there's not cartilage anymore so you rely on the the lung tissue itself to hold and grab the outsides of the tube and hold it open so that's an important that's called radial traction we'll talk about that more in class Here's the tracheobronchial tree. There's actually 23 divisions of the tree. The last, oh, what is that? Six, seven, last seven divisions, 17 through 23. Those are where gas exchange can occur. Of course, you're exchanging what for what? Oxygen is being dumped off or is being taken in by the red blood cells. Carbon dioxide is being dumped off and you breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen you load your red blood cells with oxygen and you kick carbon dioxide out in the lungs so this respiratory unit right here has a name this is called the acini or sorry it's the asinus 
is the respiratory unit. It's made up of three parts. There's respiratory bronchioles. And notice that even the respiratory bronchioles, they do have alveoli coming off them. Right, that's an important concept. Uh, and then you go into smaller pipes. Those are called the alveolar ducts. And they have tons of alveoli coming off them. And then at the end of these alveolar ducts, there's pure kind of grapes, if you will, of alveoli. Tons of heavy density of alveoli. And that, those are pure alveoli sacs. One important thing, these terminal bronchioles here, think I always think asthma when you hear terminal bronchioles because they have or they're like arterioles they have tons of smooth muscle a very smick, a thick smooth muscle layer and so people who have asthma part of the problem with asthma is you get a, a smooth muscle constriction and it squeezes the bronchioles so all these these small bronchioles here become really hard to breathe through in someone having asthma. They have a lot of trouble with expiration because of this, as we'll see when we talk about adventitious sounds. Landmark, external angle of Louis, I think we know that. It's at the level of the T4 disc. That's also where the trachea bifurcates. That T4 is that's a busy, busy landmark. Or the sternal uh, that was T4 sternal angle uh, is very easily palpated. That's the level that the trachea bifurcates uh, and a bunch of other stuff here. T4 level is uh, where the superior and inferior mediastinum are split into uh, into two parts. We've talked about that in class. Upper border of the liver we know from GIGU that when you percuss down the mid clavicular line on the right. The fifth intercostal space is where the percussion note should change from what to what? Percussion, I don't know if you can hear it. Changes from resonant, which is the normal percussion note of the lungs, to liver dullness. There's a, there's a 579 rule. If you percuss down the mid axillary line, you should that change from resonant to dullness should happen at the seventh intercostal space and on the mid clavic or mid scapular line on the back it should if you percuss down that about T9 is where that occurs. T10 is typically the base of the lung so that's just a that's just a hair lower than the actual borders Sorry, I got another video going over here, and I want to make sure that doesn't start talking. There we go. Okay, so the procedure, the analog, uh, the exam kind of path that we're going to follow uh, is inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. We know these already. These are reference lines, mid-sternal line, the famous mid-clavicular line, anterior axillary line is over there. The backside, I don't think we know this one. This is the mid-scapular line, which would match the mid-clavicular line on the front. We're going to use this for uh, the excursion test, diaphragmatic excursion test here in a little while. Okay, there's a view from the side. There's that anterior axillary line. Mid axillary line, remember the rib percusses. It'll, if you percuss down, resonant, 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 thud, dullness. So liver dullness, only that would be on the other side, of course. Liver's on the other side. Posterior axillary line. We really clinically don't use the posterior axillary line. I don't think I've ever used it for anything. All right, let's talk about patient positioning. So a little controversy, we're going to go with Bates, which is the oldest board book. So for the posterior part, which we're doing today, we're going to do the anterior next week. The posterior part of the thoracic exam and lung exam, the patient will be seated. Uh, they will have their arms crossed and slightly bent forward. 
right? And when you when you cross their arms in the front, that kind of pulls their scapulae out of the way so you can auscultate a little bit better. Right? Posterior exam, some authors say you can do it seated. It's I mean the anterior exam, some authors say you could do it seated. It's easier to do this one supine. So that's how we'll do this one. Right? So examination of the posterior thorax. Remember on the back side of the lungs you can't you can't do anything that that intermediate or that, that middle lobe is not on the right. Uh, that is non visible from the back side. Remember T10 is kind of the base, T9, T10 is kind of the base of the lungs here. So general inspection for the lab test, you'll need to know questions about that. So first thing you'll look at, now this is really from the from the trachea perspective. And yeah, so you look at the trachea from the front side, it should be straight. It shouldn't be uh, the Adam's apple, the laryngeal prominence shouldn't be pulled way over to one side or the other. That's not normal. Things like resorption atelectasis of the lungs in an asthmatic where they got a mucus plug and it plugged up one of the larger bronchioles, uh, it can cause a collapse of the lung and pull that trachea over to one side. Or if you swallow something down the wrong pipe and it gets stuck, the same thing can happen. Look for chest deformities. This is anterior, so this will cover next week as well. All those pectus excavatum and all that stuff. I'm not going to, you've had that. I'm not going to go into that. Breathing, they should be breathing 14 to 20 times per minute. And note for any accessory respiratory muscle use. People with advance, especially emphysema, uh, they will be, they're super skinny usually because they're using all their energy to breathe to stay alive. And so uh, all the accessory muscles are kicked in. Uh, and you'll see the intercostal muscles, for example, contracting when they're breathing, which is a very strange sight. So look for that. Uh, retraction of the intercostal spaces is the same as with accessory respiratory muscles kicking in to help breathe. Listen for adventitious sounds. We're going to cover those down at the bottom. We will get those today. Uh, notice the skin color, too. Uh, they shouldn't be blue, which would indicate cyanosis of... Maybe the Eisenmenger syndrome has kicked in and they have a pulmonary hypertension and the Eisenmenger syndrome has kicked in and they're getting a pathological shunt of blood from the right to the left. We talked about that through a patent foramen ovale or the ventricular septal defect or any hole in the intramuscular septums, the atrial inter interatrial septum, interventricular septum. Look at the fingernails or make sure they're not yellow too, right? They might have jaundice. You can look in the whites of their eyes should be white and not yellow. And uh, look for clubbing. Look at their fingernails. This guy, what's wrong with this guy? So not only do they have clubbing, they have cyanosis on top of the clubbing. Uh, so that's not normal. Right? So let's get right to palpation. Now we'll do a demonstration. Our internet is going super slow today. I'm trying to even get dermatology. It's taken two hours. Uh, so I don't think I'll be able to get the lab demonstration up till later. Maybe not. This might be late as well. Damn, don't get me started on uh, affinity charter, we call them. but. The whole time, this been what, two, oh, see now I got started two months, uh, we have, at this time of the day, we have no internet. And on the weekends too, and they tell me, well, we just can't fix it, we don't have enough money to fix the problem. Don't ever get Charter Affinity, or what's it called, Affinity? I don't know, I know it must Charter, anyway, that's a rant for them. Chest Expansion Test, I do like this test. If people screw up the lab midterm, this is the one that they screw up. I think it's pretty easy to do. Oh, no, this is not the one. It's the excursion they screw up. This one's pretty easy, although I'm teaching it different than the way you have learned it. I'm teaching it, again, directly from the board books. Even Jarvis, all three books show to do it this way, so I don't know where the... 
where the way you learned comes from, but if I was taking boards, I would definitely do it the way the board books show you to do it. Uh, so you want to grab underneath the traps here, or the lats here, and even more than this lady, this doctor's doing, you want to take a tissue pull and really bunch the tissue up together uh, by pulling the tissue in this way. Uh, and you want to grab the patient around. The, see, she's grabbing. You see her little fingers are grabbed right in there. That way you really have the rib cage. And then you have the patient take a deep breath in. Uh, and your fingers will, they will move apart. And the key is, and it, it's really nice that they move apart really easily. Uh, the key is to watch them. And they should move apart with great symmetry one shouldn't lag behind the other and that's the whole the whole purpose of the test it's about symmetrical motion All right so that's everything I said right there uh, what if there's not symmetrical motion what if one uh, what if the left moves out really nicely but the right doesn't do anything uh, and assuming she has other symptoms that like she's not feeling well she's sick she's been coughing this is one of the few times that one of these tests actually really means something. People with unilateral pneumonia will have very restricted expansion like this. And there's a there's an anterior chest expansion, but the posterior chest expansion test, which I really should say, it's nice I can do this here. Posterior chest expansion test, posterior chest expansion. Um, it'll be it won't move on that that part of the lung that's all filled up with water all right so look at the likelihood ratio anything over 10 is tremendous okay so this one is I mean this is ridiculous it's 44 positive likelihood ratio so that is a that is crazy all right uh, plurally fusion which is probably from bugs, it's probably from the, the unilateral pneumonia, it will also cause a restriction and you won't get good expansion of that rib cage. Likelihood of ratio of 8.1, so it's not quite as good as the other one, but it's still pretty darn strong. Okay, uh, chronic fibrosis, unilateral bronchial obstruction, uh, those, they can happen, but that's not. You think always think pneumonia, unilateral pneumonia. All right now we have the old 99. Uh, so 99. I think you actually know this already. Let's get a get my drawing. So that's when you place the metacarpal phalangeal joints of your hand. Heaven forbid, I'm going to try to draw two, three. Oh my God, four. There's a thumb. But you place your hand like that, right about where the metacarpal phalangeal joints uh, are. And why metacarpal phalangeal joints? Because you can feel vibration really nicely. They feel vibration better than the, the pads of your fingers do. Um, so you're going to test the apices of the lungs here and you're always going to go in this L-shaped pattern. We're going to expand on this pattern uh, but it's like a mirrored L pattern. It's the same for palpation, it's the same for percussion, it's the same for auscultation. The only difference with auscultation and percussion you're going to add two other points, sometimes more points in here. Uh, but so this is just kind of a basic pattern but remember this pattern and so you place the ball of your hand or the metacarpal phalangeal joints here have the patient say 99 you'll feel vibration going into your your hand and then go to the other side and compare it 99 and it should feel the same and then go down uh, between the scapula try it again 99 99 so you're comparing side to side to side. Don't forget big points off if you forget to go out here and palpate these costal margins or these lateral um, these recesses which which can fill up 
with fluid, right? Those uh, costal phrenic angles can fill up uh, with fluid. So these are the most important spots when the patient is weight bearing or gravity bearing uh, to check. So don't forget those. So 99, 99, that's called tactile frematis. Tactile frematis. Got it? So let's look at the positives because those are always going to be your questions on the tests. What decreases frematis? So what if you're feeling number four here and patient sick, not feeling good, back to that right lung, and you, she says 99, and you can't feel any vibration, but you can feel it fine over here. So what can mess up the, that transmission of vibration from her trachea, from her voice box, from her larynx, through the tracheobronchial tree, and out to your hand? Well, anything that fills up that pleural cavity with fluid or blood or pus or cancer cells, that anything that starts to push gives to, starts to cause a little atelectasis pushes the lung a little bit away from the chest wall and so even though water transmits sound pretty good it it's it's it doesn't it's still going to decrease the transmission of sound I had questions before uh, well how come if you have a hydrothorax if you have uh, water um, do I have it? Where's there's fluid? Pleural effusion? That's the same as a hydrothorax, uh, a pleural effusion. That's serous fluid. That transmits sound good, but it pushes the lung tissue too far away from the chest wall. Uh, and so that's no good. So all of these conditions will cause a decreased frematis in the affected side. Okay, is there anything that can e increase the feeling of vibration? Well, back to our unilateral pneumonia, because water does transmit sound good. Uh, if the whole lung is wet and filled with water, uh, it'll transmit that sound really well, and you'll feel a crazy uh, loud vibration there. Not loud, but you'll feel the vibration uh, really well. And so unilateral pneumonia. So here's the question, right? Here's the... Uh, here's the board question or my lab test question. So what are, what are some of the findings with a unilateral pneumonia? You'll have decreased posterior chest expansion and anterior chest expansion on the side of the pneumonia. pneumonia. You'll have increased tactile frematis on the side of the pneumonia lung. And then you're going to hear, you might hear, oscillatory crackles which sound like Velcro, it's an auscultory sound. We'll cover them in a minute, but you, you can get these. They sound like Velcro being pulled apart. All right, let's move on to percussion. So make sure you have short fingers for this. Uh, the, you're going to percuss the same as you just did tactile fremitus. You're gonna percuss side to side, side to side, side to side, side to side. And then I'll show you the pattern here in a second. Um, the percussion note you have to know, we've already talked about this, but now it's official. It's resonant. So you'll have a resonant percussion note. All right, that's the normal percussion note of the thorax, posterior thorax. Here is the pattern. So this is Bates. This is the pattern for both percussion and for auscultation. It's the same, right? You got that same L pattern, only we just have a couple more areas. And they do a double one up here. Seidel doesn't put that one in here. That's a board book, so it's probably okay if you forget that one. Um, but make sure you give me five points in the midline and at least one in the costal phrenic angle over here. Okay, so same thing. And you're just going to percuss from side to side. Uh, so your your hand will be set up your hand should be fingers when you're percussion. I'll just draw one finger because of my inability to, not that I'm giving everybody, well I can draw a couple more I guess. But your hand will be set up like that and you'll be percussing hitting the dip, right? Plexor hits the plexometer right there. Your hand should be, your fingers should be 
perpendicular to the bottom of the film when you're doing this and then you'll go over here and you'll do the same thing you're all you're going to use the same hand you're not going to switch hands so use the same hand uh, check this one check that one is it a resonant percussion note check this and that don't hit the scapula it'll be dull check this compared to that this compared to that this compared to that and then do the costal phrenic angles to make sure they have a nice resonant sound got it oh there's a picture so notice how this is this is his head would be kind of an obliqueish view but his head would be right here this is the superior nuchal line EOP is here he had a brain injury so he had his skull broken I guess at one time his hair would be here okay that's why I don't draw <laughs> Look, that makes me laugh even um, anyway that you get the point the fingers are parallel to the earth the bottom of the film okay don't go don't make them perpendicular or you get points off all right so we know the plexure and the plexometer already so I don't have to go over that with you you know how to percuss one two move one two move one two so let's look at some uh, some normals and abnormal or the normal percussion notes so we have resonance most but it's not everywhere um, there are some tympanic regions uh, which would be heard over Traub space so we'll talk about that soon in GIGU uh, but normally it's it's either resonant or dull Traub space is on the anterior thorax so we'll talk about that next week but dullness, you, like if you run over the scapula, that'll be dull. If you go down too far and hit the liver, that will be dull. Okay, what are positive findings for percussion? Any any asymmetric dullness is not a good sign in, in areas that have no explanation. Like if you're, today's easy, if you're percussing the back of the lungs, one area shouldn't be dull. Uh, plural effusion could cause dullness. Uh, a tumor or a mass you can see that the likelihood ratio is pneumonia really crummy here so this this percussion really isn't a very useful hyper resonant if someone has COPD they their lungs are typically over expanded uh, so that could cause a hyper resonant sound all right this is the one people have trouble with this is diaphragmatic excursion. All right, so let's talk about this. By the way, this just, I just kind of popped into my head. I remember people doing this from last quarter. There's no tape measures used here. It's only watching how your thumbs expand for posterior chest expansion you don't measure anything you don't put your hands up higher this is how the board books and Jarvis and McGee show to do it so for boards and for me this is the way you do it I'll take points off if you start doing silly stuff and putting hands up here and and things like that do it just like I've taught you with the board books okay because somebody always doesn't come to class and doesn't pay attention and they they go put their hands way up here on the scapulas. Well, that's the way we're taught. That's not the way I'm teaching you. Right? I'm teaching you the way the board books say to do it. Who's going to test you? The board books are going to test you. So do it the way the board books and Dr. Gillard says to do it. Thank you very much. Anyway, uh, where are we now? I get lost track with my rant. We did percussion. You can see the the resonant regions here, flat or dullness over the scapula, dullness over the liver. <clears throat> over the left side, uh, it's just called it's just called visceral dullness, but it's still going to be dull. 
All right, we went over that pattern. We went over that. Percussion notes. Here's the percussion notes. Resonant. We talked about that. We talked about timpani already. That's in Traub space. All right, we're down here, diaphragmatic excursion. Uh, so this one's a little tricky, I think. People, this is the one people screw up. So let's talk us through this one. So what does excursion mean? So excursion, when you take a deep breath in, what happens to your diaphragm? It drops way down and your lung expands, it stretches out. When you blow all the way the air out, what happens? Well, your, your diaphragm pushes your lung tissue up. So the difference between up and down is excursion. And here's a number you need to know. Uh, it should be between three and five centimeters is normal, like a three by five note card. Some athletes, it might even be eight. We're not gonna worry about those. We're just gonna worry about normal. So three by five in the mid clavic or mid scapular line, which is still the mid clavicular line really, just on the back side. So how do you do this? So <clears throat> patient's gonna take a deep breath in and hold it. As they take a deep breath in, the diaphragm, let's do it on this side. As they take a deep breath in, the diaphragm's gonna drop down to here. Right? So you're gonna come percussing down, just like she's percussing here. You percuss here, percuss here, still resonant, 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 thud. Once you hit the dullness, the visceral dullness, or the liver dullness on this side, once you hit that, you take out your marking pencil and you mark a line. See, just like it's over here. Now let the patient rest for a second, and we're gonna reset. So after they've rested, you're gonna have them take a little breath of air in and blow all the air out. And as they blow the air out, the diaphragm moves up to maybe about here. Right, so we already had our other mark right here. So now, while they're holding the air out, you're going to percuss down again, thud, or not thud yet, resonant, 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 thud, right there. What's happening with my trackpad? Here's going cuckoo. Thud. Okay, so get your blue pen out and mark it again. And now you get your tape measure out and you measure the excursion between here and here. And it better be between three to five, right? Better be between three to five centimeters, and that has normal excursion. All right, are we good with that? Awesome. So what could, and you repeat on the other side. In lab, I'm just going to make you do it on one side. What could decrease excursion? What if you only had like a quarter of a centimeter of excursion? What could do that? Well, anything that pushes up the diaphragm would decrease excursion because you can't bring it down if there's a mass in the peritoneal cavity. So things like ascites from cirrhosis of the liver, hepatomegaly from cirrhosis of the liver, pregnancy, right? So those all push the diaphragm up. What about things that push the diaphragm down? Emphysema, COPD patients could have a decreased uh, excursion. Okay, that's all I'll say about that one. Now auscultation, so we're going to be using the diaphragm to auscultate and we have to know the breath sounds first. So the breath sounds are caused by the air flowing through the tracheobronchial tree and it makes specific sounds. In fact, there are four sounds that they say you can hear. I honestly, I think you can hear vesicular sounds and tracheal sounds, and that's about it. I think you have to have very high-powered stethoscopes. But nevertheless, you have to know these. So the normal breath sound is vesicular sounds. So it's a low-pitch sound, but not low enough to use the bell. So you'll still be using the diaphragm. And this is heard over most of the lung fields. It's the authors say it sounds like 
like gentle uh, leaves rustling in a gentle breeze right now when you get closer to the bigger pipes the pitch the bigger the pipe you auscultate over the higher pitch the sound is so bronchial vesicular sounds are next those are heard in the second and first intercostal spaces or between the scapula bronchial sounds are even higher pitch sound and these are heard over the manubrium tracheal sounds are heard over the trachea so let's look at some of these uh, so on the back which we're doing today most of the lung tissue will be vesicular but remember don't auscultate over the scapula you won't hear anything you have to in the patient's arms should be folded here Jarvis uh, they're not folded but they should be folded to pull those scapula so if you auscultate here and Jarvis tries to get a little cuckoo here I'm just saying that it's all vesicular back here or I guess we can say let's let's do this is what I usually do we fr we just get rid of the vesicular here everything between the scapula is bronchial vesicular and that makes sense because the pipes are bigger here so that's all we can hear is a lower pitch vesicular sounds like leaves rustling in the gentle breeze of autumn and between the scapula these are bronchial vesicular sounds okay front side we talk about that next week but I can show you right now just in case vesicular everywhere bronchial vesicular is in the second intercostal space bronchial or over the manubrium very high pitched and tracheal will be over the trachea the procedure you're just going to use that same L pattern you're going to have the patient breathe take breathe through the mouth don't say okay take a deep breath okay keep doing that they'll 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 get faint right you can't have them keep uh, blowing carbon dioxide off like that um, so I have them breathe through an open mouth you tell them to breathe a little bit deeper like you just got done running but I don't want you to you know, go crazy with it if you do that and listen 1001 1002 1003 switch 1001 1002 1003 switch 1001 1002 1003 switch etc if you do that pattern um, you will hear the sounds quite nicely right what are you listening for the pitch the intensity the duration basically that's nice but what are you really listening for you're listening for abnormal sounds these are the adventitious sounds you're listening for so we have crackles wheezes ronchi and strider strider is not classically one of the adventitious sounds but I always throw it in there uh, according to the American Thoracic Society crackles wheezes ronchi these are the adventitious sounds crackles equals a crackling sound like velcro being pulled apart not brand new hard velcro but kind of loose velcro that's older and it's easier to pull apart these are heard during inspiration and they're not sure what causes them we'll talk about it more in class but they think it's from a collapse of the terminal bronchioles uh, especially if they're wet filled with water and when you take a breath in those tubes snap open and they think that's what it's from but that doesn't really work because the number one cause of crackles is actually pulmonary fibrosis and that has nothing to do with anything being wet so they really don't know what causes them uh, but pulmonary fibrosis if you're crackles and they're not sick and coughing it's probably well, they still might be coughing but they don't have a fever from acute pneumonia pulmonary edema too from pulmonary hypertension can also call, cause crackles good high yield stuff wherever you see stars again they're hard to put in here so I don't I'm very sparing with my stars uh, wheezes and ronca or wheezes and strider that's the other reason I reason I put strider in here because they're both similar they're both musical notes it sounds like a music like they're playing some kind of an instrument but the difference is this this high-pitched 400 hertz musical sound is only heard with inspiration only heard with inspiration uh, I'm sorry expiration duh read the slide expiration I th always think of wheezing they can't blow out a birthday candle uh, and then wheezing expiration problems asthma these guys go together 
people having an asthma attack, they can't b blow out a birthday candle on a cake. Okay, uh, let's jump to Strider, even though it's not a classic adventitious sound. Okay, why isn't that working? There we go. Uh, it's also 400 hertz sound, but this one is only heard on inspiration. So this is from, they swallowed a Lego. There, there's a physical blockage uh, in the tracheobronchial tree somewhere. Not in the esophagus, but in the tracheobronchial tree. And the difference between strider and wheezing, strider is heard during inspiration. Wheezing is heard during expiration. Can't blow out a candle. Ronchi they want to get rid of. McGee goes on a big rant about how dumb this one. Well, he doesn't say how dumb it is. But this is the death rattle. This is seen in people who are dying, usually of pneumonia, and they don't have the power to clear the mucus out of their throat. And that's it. You could, if they got power and got better, they could clear this sound, but it's a, uh, it's very low pitch, about 200 hertz, even less than 200 hertz. It's also heard during expiration. Okay, so that is it. We're done with the lab, and I'll get that demonstration done as soon as possible. And we'll see you in the next video. And we'll keep our fingers crossed. I did this on a different computer. So let's hope this works.